If you want to cook pasta, take a large star that is about to go out and boil it until it goes supernova and explodes. You might need to wait for a billion years till it happens. So you'll need all the patience you've got. After the explosion, gather all leftover protons and electrons and vigorously stir them inside the star's shriveled core. Have they merged into a soup of immensely dense neutrons? Time to apply as much gravity as possible. Now, squash the stew into an airtight sphere the size of Chicago and cover the dish with a crystalline crust. Finally, heat it up to 1.08 million degrees Fahrenheit. What are you saying? It doesn't sound like a pasta recipe? That's because you've just made one of the strangest and strongest concoctions in the universe. Nuclear pasta. For a few years, astrophysicists have been contemplating the idea of the existence of nuclear pasta. Such tangles of matter might be moving around inside neutron stars. Once a star becomes too old and massive, about four to eight times as big as our sun, it doesn't have any fuel left. The reactions in its core slow down and then stop completely. The star's outer layers try to collapse inward, but they bounce off the core, which remains incredibly dense. That's when everything but the star's core blasts out all over the universe in a bright supernova explosion. But that's not the end of the star. Even without the outer layers, its core keeps collapsing. At one point, the pressure inside becomes so great that electrons and protons melt into each other and form neutrons. The result of this crazy fusion is a neutron star whose mass consists of 90% of neutrons. It means that the resulting space object just can't be squashed any tighter. Then, energy starts to leave the fading star, transforming it into a neutron star. And the amount of this energy is so great that it can be compared with the combined light emitted by all the stars in the observable universe. Interestingly, neutron stars are relatively small. Even though scientists don't know for sure how big neutron stars can be, they suppose that these space bodies shouldn't be larger than 12 miles across. Nuclear pasta might be the only matter that can survive in a star after a supernova, and it may also be the strongest substance in the universe. In a new study, a team of scientists from the United States and Canada made several computer simulations, testing the potential strength of nuclear pasta based on everything we know about neutron stars and the conditions under which nuclear pasta is likely to form. The researchers determined that to shatter nuclear pasta, we'd need about 10 billion times the force needed to shatter steel. The incredible strength of nuclear pasta probably comes from its immense density. Nuclear pasta is believed to only exist inside neutron stars, and we've already spoken about how dense these celestial objects are. To exist in such extreme conditions, everything inside a neutron star has to become way heavier than it would be anywhere else in the universe. In 2007, a NASA blog post even claimed that a sugar cube's worth of matter would weigh more than 1 billion tons inside a neutron star. That's roughly equal to the weight of Mount Everest, according to a new study. Nuclear pasta might be so strong and densely packed that it could layer up and form small mountains, capable of lifting the crust of some neutron stars. As neutron stars rotate, and they can do it unbelievably quickly, these lumps, on the surface of stars, might theoretically produce ripples in the surrounding space-time. Such ripples are also known as gravitational waves. This phenomenon was detected when two neutron stars collided but it's still unknown whether nuclear pasta had anything to do with this unique gravitational outcome. Further research is definitely needed. I have a new recipe for you today. It's easy, you just have to follow three simple steps. First, you need to find one big star nearing the end of its life and heat it up until it explodes. That's called a supernova, the biggest and most powerful explosion we know about. It could take a while, maybe around a billion years, so you have to be patient. Step 2. As the core of this star is falling apart, stir all these electrons and protons until you mix them and turn them into a very dense soup. It's going to be hard, but you can't stop stirring. Toss in some gravity and apply as much as you think you need. So now you have some nice neutron stew. Crumple it to get an airtight sphere, approximately the size of Toronto. Cover the sphere with a crystalline crust, 
And it's almost done. Now you only need to serve it at about 1.08 million degrees Fahrenheit. This was a recipe for nuclear pasta. It's material that's 10 billion times stronger than steel. Talk about al dente, huh? No one can create something like that in a laboratory to really check how heavy and strong this material is. But computer simulations have shown it. Nuclear pasta could be one of the strongest materials in the universe in general. Neutrons inside the star are packed really densely, and the closer you get to the center, the denser it becomes. Neutrons get squeezed together and squished until they completely deform. Density there is more than 100 trillion times greater than the density of water. And the gravity is extremely strong too. On average, it's 200 billion times more powerful than the gravity on our planet. These crazy shapes that we call nuclear pasta are probably present only inside neutron stars. Their strong gravitational forces make their outer layers freeze solid, so they turn into a crust. But the insides are a liquid core. And there's also a fun party happening beneath the crust. Strong forces roil between the protons and neutrons and pull and push them in different ways. That means you can see all kinds of shapes below the surface. And scientists believe these shapes look a bit like pasta. For example, gnocchi and lasagna. These crazy shapes that we call nuclear pasta are probably present only inside neutron stars. It's incredibly strong, mostly because of its density. It's harder to break a coffee table than a cracker, right? How strong a material is going to be depends on its internal structure and how its atoms fit together. That's why some materials, such as chalk, are relatively weak because of all those holes. Diamonds are really strong since their atoms are well organized. Let's say you have a really massive star, like eight times the mass of our sun. Bam! It collapses under the power of its own gravity. What's interesting is that a giant star can live for millions of years, but it can collapse within less than a second. And as a result, you get the whole mass of this giant star, but in a very compact core that's around 12 miles across. It would be like squishing the mass of 1.3 million Earths into one average American city. These are extreme conditions, and to be able to exist in such conditions, all matter inside a neutron star becomes way heavier than it would be in any other place in the universe. It's like having a single sugar cube that weighs over a billion tons, which is approximately the weight of Mount Everest. Neutron stars are also very hot. The temperature on their surface can go up to 1.8 million degrees Fahrenheit. For comparison, it's about 180 times hotter than the surface of our sun. And there are around 100 million neutron stars in our galaxy. We can spot them when they're relatively young. When they're not, they rotate really slowly. And they're also cold, which makes it hard to detect them. Neutrinos are very small particles that have almost no mass and travel at almost light speed. In only a couple of seconds after a star starts turning into a neutron star, the energy in neutrinos is the same as the total amount of light emitted by all of the stars we know about. Yeah, that's a lot. Listen up to this cool theory. If there was life on neutron stars, it could be two-dimensional like in all those PC games that were popular in the 90s. Neutron stars are objects with some of the most powerful magnetic fields and gravity in the entire universe. The gravity is so incredibly strong there that it would probably flatten almost anything that ends up on the star's surface. Even the atmosphere would be different. Our home planet has an atmosphere that goes hundreds of miles into the sky. And since the gravitational force on a neutron star is so extreme, an atmosphere there could stretch for less than one foot. The fastest spinning neutron star that we know about rotates nearly 700 times in a second. And most of the neutron stars are probably pulsars, or they were at one point. A pulsar is a star that spins really fast. And while doing that, it spits out beams of radio waves. On Earth, it looks as if a giant lighthouse illuminates us. Because of their powerful fields, neutron stars can be dangerous for us too. If one got into our solar system, it would get chaotic. It could throw planets out of their orbits. 
If it got close enough to our planet, it could raise tides that would rip Earth apart. And what would be even more dangerous for us would be radiation generated by its magnetic field. Luckily, neutron stars are far away. The closest one is around 500 light years away. There was an interesting case where scientists studied two neutron stars producing strong gravitational waves. Two different stars here went through supernova explosions and left two extremely dense cores, neutron stars, behind. Scientists assumed these stars were going to merge, but they did something else instead. They were so close to each other that gravity pulled them together. They merged and created a black hole with one of the greatest mass we've ever found. Black holes and neutron stars have something in common. They both appear after stars finish existing, but black holes form when bigger stars explode. They're both extremely dense. You already know that not even light can escape a black hole because of its extreme gravity. Since they form in a similar way, some experts even say that neutron stars are failed black holes. Black holes are space objects that can create huge amounts of energy, although they don't produce any. But when two of them collide, there's more energy than all of the stars in the universe produce together. Black holes emit it in the form of gravitational waves. Most galaxies have one supermassive black hole in their center. Some of them are active, which means they shoot jets of different materials out of their centers. But most of them are quiet, sort of hibernating and waiting for some space object to come closer to feed on, like some hungry predator lurking in the darkness. So if you dropped something, let's say your keys into a black hole, it would pull it inside before you even realize what's happening. Its extreme gravitational pull actually warps up space and slows down time. It would tug the keys closer and closer. After a while, they would go through an accretion disk surrounding the hole. This disk consists of space materials like gases, dust, and even rocks that circle inward around something we call the event horizon, which is basically the point of no return. Once your keys got inside, there's no chance you would get them back. They would probably end up being super stretched, or as science says it, spaghettified. Hmm. A lot of things today are about food. I'm really getting hungry here. At the center of the black hole, there's a tiny point with enormous mass where density and gravity become infinite. It means time and space are different there than on Earth. Kind of distorted. At least, that's what we can assume. Recently, Chinese scientists discovered something interesting on the moon, an unusual crystal. Moreover, they found out that this crystal contains an element that can literally replace nuclear fuel. Let's find out more. The composition of the moon has long remained a mystery to us. Half a century has already passed since the Apollo mission. Unfortunately, we haven't traveled to the moon much since then. So it's not surprising that it's not so easy for us to study it. But recently, we've made a breakthrough in this area. In December 2020, Chinese scientists sent the Chang'e 5 probe to the moon. The mission was named after the ancient Chinese deity of the moon, Chang'e. Quite poetic, isn't it? Anyway, after the probe went to the nearest side of the moon, it spent several days digging through the surface and rocks and then returned to Earth. In total, it collected about four pounds of various lunar rocks, like basalt, solidified lava, and so on. And yeah, maybe it doesn't sound too impressive, but it's actually a mini breakthrough. After all, we hadn't received any lunar samples since 1976. And these samples are very important for learning the history of our world. We've been struggling for many years to find out, for example, how the moon was born at all. Yes, there were a lot of theories, but we still couldn't find any proper evidence for any of them. But thanks to the latest missions and some computer simulations, scientists finally found out the truth. The moon was born when some random dwarf planet crashed into our Earth many millions of years ago. This dwarf planet was slightly smaller than Mars. The fragments of the Earth went into space, but some of them stayed in our orbit. Then they stuck together and formed the moon. It sounds horrifying, but in reality, the birth of the moon was the best thing to ever happen to our planet. 
If it weren't for this beautiful satellite, all our oceans would be small puddles. Life wouldn't have appeared on Earth at all. So this is already an amazing discovery, but that's still not all. Studying the collected rocks, scientists from the Beijing Research Institute discovered something unusual, a rare lunar crystal. Looks pretty boring, doesn't it? Just some tiny transparent monocrystal about the thickness of a human hair. We've already found such things on the moon before. These crystals were formed as a result of volcanic activity, just like some garnets on the Earth. And yep, the place where they discovered these crystals also suffered from volcanoes 1.2 billion years ago. That means that this tiny baby is over a billion years old. But that's not the most important thing. It's the fact that this crystal is made of a unique material, the one that we've never seen before. Researchers from the International Mineralogical Association have confirmed that such a composition can't be found anywhere on Earth. The crystal was named Chongasite, again after the same moon deity. And this is another achievement. This is the sixth previously unknown mineral that we've found on the moon and the first one found by China. Now, it has become the third country in the world to make such a lunar discovery. However, this tiny crystal still wasn't the only remarkable thing they found. After studying this gem and about 140,000 other lunar particles, scientists have discovered something else. They found helium-3. Why is it so important? Because this is one of the elements that feed the sun and other stars in our universe. We tend to say stuff like, put out the sun, the sun is burning, and so on. And this is one of the reasons why many people actually think that the sun is a huge fireball. But it's not. Its burning is actually a completely different process, which is called nuclear fusion. The process itself is quite simple. During this reaction, hydrogen in the star turns into helium. But this simple process is actually one of the most violent and insane reactions in the universe. There's a real boiling broth of particles inside the sun. The hydrogen nuclei that jump and rush there are constantly repelling each other since all of them are positively charged. And so they could continue to boil and chill around without bothering anyone if it weren't for the stars. The stars turned out to be cheaters. They have such strong gravity that they basically grab billions of these little atoms and squeeze them together. Combining with each other, these atoms create new heavy elements, like the mentioned helium. And when this happens, they throw a lot of energy into space. And that's how the sun burns. At the same time, it spreads so much energy that we can't even imagine. Okay, so what is helium-3? Well, this is an element to which even the sun can say, whoa, dude, you should calm down. The fusion of helium-3 atoms releases even more energy than in typical nuclear fusion. And most importantly, it doesn't pollute the atmosphere with harmful things like radiation. We have very, very little helium-3 on Earth. Its prevalence in our atmosphere is about one in a million. And besides, it's constantly trying to escape from us back into space probably feel some bad vibes from us. However, scientists have recently found out that there's a place that contains a lot of this element. Yep, you guessed it, it's the moon. We think that there's more helium-3 on the moon than on Earth because of the solar winds. The sun has been hammering on the moon with its helium-3 for billions of years, so now it's all over the place. It's still not too much if you compare it, for example, with Jupiter or Saturn. But don't forget how much energy it can release. For your information, with only 25 tons of helium-3, it's possible to provide America with energy for an entire year. Now, there are 35,000 tons of it here on Earth, and more than a million tons on the Moon. Only these sources could feed the entire US for thousands of years. So basically, in the future, helium-3 may become a new source of fuel. And it's better than nuclear fuel in basically everything. Helium-3 won't leave any harmful waste and radiation. It's more powerful and not that dangerous. In other words, this environmentally friendly and efficient energy could be a revolution for our planet. 
Sounds cool, huh? So, what are we waiting for? Grab the shovels, you might say. But there's a little problem here. Unfortunately, we haven't yet come up with anything as wildly strong and hot as the stars. To use helium-3, we need crazy temperatures and pressure. We need a thermonuclear reactor, and we have no idea how to build it. Yet. And even if we could heat it up to such temperatures and get the needed pressure, we still don't really know how to handle helium-3 correctly. Therefore, even if we have an infinite amount of helium-3, we still won't be able to use it. But still, there's a great power behind helium-3, so it's not surprising that different countries have already started a race for nuclear resources. Now that Chang'e 5 has discovered a new helium-3 deposit on the nearest side of the moon, this race can become downright global. For example, China already plans a new lunar mission in 2024, Chang'e 6. During this mission, they want to collect the first samples from the far side of the moon. As you can see, finding this lunar crystal was very important for us. These crystals can help us find new ways to create helium-3. And if we manage to do that, humankind will enter a new era. But to do this, we still have to solve a number of problems. How to deliver a bunch of these lunar crystals to Earth, how to make them produce energy, and so on. Let's hope that in the future these issues will be resolved and we'll find a way to produce clean, safe, unlimited energy. How much would a pinch of sand be worth to you? How about without the elements of gold or platinum mixed into it, just moon dust? A recent auction sold it for half a million dollars, for literally just a pinch of what's on the moon. But this apparently valuable minuscule amount of dirt was valued purely on its historical relevance. That pinch of sticky moon sand was from a small pouch that was collected by Neil Armstrong on the Apollo 11 mission in 1969. It was a huge piece of human history and a physical reminder of when man first landed on the moon, something taken from a place that no one else has ever been able to. Selling something from the moon opens a whole new debate around the legality of owning, using, and selling space resources from unclaimed parts of the solar system. Currently, the world abides by the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which depicts the foundations of modern space law. This treaty, established so long ago, didn't predict the lucrative use of outer worlds for resource utilization. Although this treaty prevents anyone from claiming ownership of any new worlds, the potential value of these unclaimed territories is priceless. The moon is not only a stepping stone for future exploration into outer space, from which moon bases and possibly moon cities will one day thrive. For this purpose, humans will need to develop shipping bays and factories to support carriers to cross into new worlds. This project will need some good investments. Mining stations will provide the economy of the hypothetical moon city. There will be infrastructure and transportation to the moon and back again. All of this will cost a lot, way more than a reminder of when man first walked on the moon. So apart from moon dust, what else could be valuable on the moon? There is value in the resources on the moon. We don't know the exact numbers, but it's estimated that there is more than was thought in the past. The Earth's natural satellite is believed to be abundant with iron, nickel, and cobalt, amongst many more. These minerals provide the potential for building Moon City itself. Just as in human history, cities around the world are a reflection of what resources are in abundance in their surroundings, and Moon City will be the same in that way. A gray city, walls made with metal, iron dust, and a lunar sand concrete, with great windows made from the unlimited sand available. The moon is also rich in silicon, an important ingredient in producing solar panel arrays. There's calcium to be used to fabricate the silicon-based solar cells, along with other ingredients found there, like titanium oxide, iron, and aluminum. The long dormant lunar magma ocean residing under its surface holds magnesium. It's especially prominent within the lower crust and is useful for many purposes, most importantly for alloys with expected space travel. The production of steel requires many sources of carbon, 
crucially important for supporting the mega factories and for the many thousands of ships that will be built. Numerous rare earth materials are used in everything electrical. They continue to be more valuable, and their production is more prominent as technology progresses, especially in electric vehicles and wind turbines. Although rare earth materials are abundant on our planet, you won't find them in many concentrated areas. They are spread thin throughout the earth, so locating and mining them is pretty costly, though they're more required with every year. The process of finding and mining on the moon is far easier and will be an important alternate source. Nitrogen, along with carbon, are important elements to support human colonization and farming and ensure that the moon is not only habitable, but has a constant supply of food. We can obtain them within the moon's outer crust, so farming is possible there within sealed biospheres. Mining metals is a difficult process, but the result is worth it, not only for their value, but also because of the valuable byproducts that you can get in the process of extraction. It can be oxygen, available for breathable air within the city, and hydrogen to ensure water for the plants and for drinking. Valuable resources will not only come from within the surface of the moon. Its potential for solar power is so huge, it will ensure harvesting the solar waves to power Moon City. The fact that it lacks a thick atmosphere and that there's no interruption of weather patterns removes some major obstacles that are present on Earth. The energy created could be sufficient for all requirements on the Moon and, in the short term, may also help solve many of Earth's power concerns. Extracting resources and manufacturing requirements will be significant as time carries forward. As Moon City is going to grow, and humans will reach further into outer space, it will require more and more energy. The output to factories and production on the Moon will become so elaborate that they will need alternate sources in reserve. Atom-powered fusion will be an important source of energy with no dangerous byproduct. It will be safer than the technologies of today that use uranium. Feeding this kind of fusion will require the most valuable of all resources found on the moon, helium-3. It's not only present on the moon, but can also be found on Earth. But the amount is super limited here due to our planet's strong magnetic field. It ensures life can thrive on Earth, but at the same time, deflects the solar winds from the sun, making it difficult for helium-3 to be produced. The moon has no magnetic field and has been absorbing the solar wind for billions of years, constantly building up an endless supply of helium-3 in the process. It absorbs the winds into the top layer of solid material on the moon, also known as the regolith. The regolith is spread all over the moon and it makes the extraction of the helium-3 an even more valuable action. Mining it would also include mining all the other valuable minerals in the process. The value of helium-3 is so substantial that many countries and companies are determined to gain a foothold on the moon. The value of this alone is within trillions of dollars. Some people believe the opportunities that helium-3 will give humanity are immeasurable. There will be unlimited energy providing millions of jobs in Moon City. That energy will also support the Earth's needs. Only 25 tons of helium-3 could power the United States for an entire year. This resource will provide the potential to power all of Earth for thousands of years and have enough energy required to help guide humans further into space. It will enable the construction of spaceports around Earth and allow for a more efficient journey from Earth to orbit. From there, people will be transferred to shuttles destined for other locations throughout the solar system. The lengths of spaceflight will be reduced significantly, creating more frequent flights toward Mars. Further ports will be erected around its orbit, supporting new colonies to reside on its surface. Mining colonies with the support of endless energy will spread throughout the red planet with more valuable resources residing within its red soil. This new age of colonization in the solar system will cause a domino effect as it continues to push further, advancing with every generation of vessels developed. Travel will get more and more efficient as the Helium-3 will continue to assist in advancing the technology of spacefaring ships. Outposts of all purposes will develop on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. 
from researching for potential habitability for life on Europa or Enceladus to continuing the tradition of extracting valuable resources in every location. The Moon will continue to find ways to provide the energy that's needed for terraforming new worlds. It will assist in warming Mars and powering an artificial magnetic field. It will also help with constructing a large reflector that will be able to cool down Venus. All of these will be the foundations for creating further livable locations for future generations of humans, all thanks to that initial source of energy from the Moon. It's difficult to put an overall price tag on the Moon, even when you know that there is value in harvesting its resources. The value of what the Moon dust really amounts to can't be determined by a monetary figure, but by its potential to influence what humans can create as we continue to progress as a species. Every April, a group of scientists observes the faint glow of asteroids passing by our planet. One year, they realized there was something weird shimmering in their telescopes. The team expected it to be another asteroid. But they ended up very surprised, because what they discovered was an unusual space rock that didn't consist of the minerals that usually make up asteroids. It was made of silicon, the material mostly found on the moon. They named it Kamo Oaliwa, which is a Hawaiian word that means wobbling celestial object. The rock didn't match any near-Earth asteroid scientists had already been familiar with. Instead, that piece had a pattern of reflected light similar to that of the moon rocks astronauts had brought back from NASA missions. This fragment turned out to be a quasi-satellite, which is a kind of asteroids that orbit both our planet and the Sun. It repeatedly circles Earth and has a quite unusual tilt. That's the reason you can only see it in the night sky once a year. The fragment is pretty shy, too. Aww. It never gets closer to our planet than 9 million miles. That's almost 40 times as far away as the Moon. Plus, this space body often hides in the shadows. Scientists have figured out the piece won't stay in this orbit for a long time. It probably arrived at its current position about 500 years ago. And its orbit is likely to change in the next 300 years. This fragment may not be alone out there in space. Mm -mm. There are at least three more similar near-Earth objects. They may have all come from the same place. Researchers aren't sure yet about the nature of the rock, but they can find out more about this unusual space object if they send a spacecraft to collect samples and bring them to Earth. That's something China's space agency is planning to do later this decade. Now, the moon appeared in the middle of chaos. There are several theories about how that happened. The first one claims the Moon used to be just a wandering body, similar to an asteroid. It formed somewhere in our solar system. Once, it approached too close to Earth and got captured by our planet's gravity. The second theory says that our planet was spinning so quickly that some material broke off and started circling around it. One of the largest pieces was the Moon. The third theory says that the Moon was formed at a time when our planet was going through its own formation process. But today, the most widely accepted theory goes like this. Once, a long, long time ago, but not in a galaxy far, far away. Earth collided with a Mars-sized planet. The debris and clouds of dust from the collision gathered around our planet and started circling it. Eventually, something that we today know as the Moon formed there. Apollo missions brought more than a third of a ton of soil and rock from the lunar surface. These rocks show that the Moon had mostly the same building materials as our planet. This might mean they have a common history. If the Moon had been formed somewhere else and had been eventually captured by the gravitational force of our planet, it would have a different composition. Also, if it had been created at the same time as our planet or had once broken off, there would be the same minerals on both the Moon and Earth. But the minerals on the Moon contain less water. Plus, our planet's natural satellite is rich in materials that form fast at high temperatures. Now, the Moon isn't the only space body in the solar system with a mysterious past. Hippocamp is Neptune's moon, discovered in 2013. It's the smallest moon of this ice giant, a mere 21 miles across. It's very close to Proteus, the biggest of Neptune's inner moons. And no, Hippocamp is not a place for big African mammals to spend the summer. Scientists think Hippocamp probably formed from debris after Proteus collided with a comet. If Hippocamp had entered Proteus's orbit from some other place in our solar system, the bigger moon would have either swallowed it or booted the tiny moon away. 
But not even Proteus itself is among the first generation of Neptune's moons. It was formed from the remains of the planet's earliest system of moons. Those first moons were destroyed when Neptune captured Triton, currently the largest of its moons. The main evidence proving the collision was likely to happen is the fact that Triton circles around Neptune backward, unlike other moons orbiting the planet. Neptune captured Triton from the Kuiper Belt. That's an area filled with icy objects and rocky debris stretching beyond Uranus. That means Hippocamp is a third-generation moon. Kind of like a second cousin twice removed or something. Now the Sun also had a turbulent past. Our star appeared about 4.6 billion years ago. It's hard to study its early stages of life since that happened 50 million years before our planet was even formed. But recently, a team of researchers has discovered crystals that are over 4.5 billion years old. Hidden deep within meteorites, they've revealed some things about the past of our Sun. Before the planets were formed, our solar system had consisted of a central star and a massive disk of dust and hot gas spiraling around it. As the dust and gases cooled down, they turned into minerals, including the crystals found in the meteorites that landed on our planet. Those ancient materials were irradiated, unlike some younger substances. Researchers think something might have happened to the Sun after those crystals were formed. Perhaps the activity of our star was less intense then. Or maybe, for some reason, these younger materials couldn't travel to the areas where irradiation was possible. Dwarf planets give us a chance to sneak a peek into the ancient years of the solar system. Around 4 billion years ago, Jupiter's, Saturn's, and Neptune's gravitational forces joined. They sent asteroids and comets hurtling across the solar system, making them collide with different planets. All the dwarf planets from the Kuiper Belt, for example Pluto, Eris, Haumea, Makemake, have their own moons that likely formed after some powerful collisions. Icy debris in orbits similar to Haumea's, for example, can prove the theory of an ancient collision. The debris it created simply didn't have enough energy to float away from the dwarf planet's gravitational pull. Ceres, another dwarf planet, has ammonia-rich clays on its surface. Ammonia isn't stable at the temperatures prevailing on Ceres, but there's plenty of this substance in the outer solar system. It means that Ceres was probably formed in those outer parts and got kicked inward. After all, the gas giants were migrating a lot at those early stages of the solar system. Or the dwarf planet could have formed in an asteroid belt, and ammonia somehow, let's say after a powerful impact, appeared on the dwarf planet. Ceres might help scientists understand icy moons better. The ocean floor on Earth has a high concentration of carbonate minerals, and some parts of Ceres have them too. This means this dwarf planet is like some sort of fossilized ocean world. Many exoplanets, a term used for planets outside the solar system, have also gone through pretty intense collisions in their early stages. This double star system is more than 300 light years away from us, and its stars are at least 1 billion years old. Even though it's not young, this system still shows some signs of swirling clouds of dusty debris that haven't cooled down yet, which isn't something you'd expect from a star system of this age. This debris is still warm. It means there might have been a strong collision of two planets or some other space bodies of similar size in that region and relatively recently. So hey, everybody just simmer down. Dust particles circle around a young star. They stick together and grow bigger with time. That's how planets form. The leftover dust often settles in some distant cold areas. An example in our solar system is the Kuiper Belt. It's located far away beyond Neptune. As solar systems evolve, those particles keep colliding until they're so small they end up being pulled into nearby stars or kicked out of the system. Uranus spins on its side if you compare it with the rest of the planets in our solar system. And the only way we can explain it is a powerful collision in the past. Something much bigger than a regular comet or some other space body of similar size likely hit Uranus and knocked the planet on the side. It was probably a planet twice the size of Earth. It could be a protoplanet. This is a space body made up mostly of ice and rock that orbits a star and is likely to develop into a planet sometime in the future. Anyway, the fallout from the impact smothered the core of Uranus. It prevented the heat inside the planet from escaping. This might explain why Uranus has extremely cold temperatures on its surface. <laughs> Man, bring a jacket and a blanket. You've been training for this for years. You know you're ready. 
You're standing on the door's threshold. You take a deep breath and bravely open it. You jump outside the International Space Station and into the vastness of space. Ah, this never gets old, you say on the transmitter device. You feel like a feather whenever moving through space. Except for the suit, of course. It's true what that guy told you one day. Astronaut suits limit your body's movement by 20%. For you, that means you've got a 20% higher chance of being clumsy in outer space, which is never good odds. There's not a lot of room for error during a spacewalk. You finally get to the docking port. You look around and see the part of the station that needs fixing. This is where other space shuttles dock when they come in from Earth or other planets. About a week ago, a shuttle coming from Jupiter miscalculated the landing and broke a piece of the port. You've attached the new shield to your suit's belt. Now all you've got to do is screw it on the station. You've spent hours training underwater to do this. You wore a heavy, hot, uncomfortable suit inside a pool in order to get the training you needed. Incoming! Sarah shouts on the transmitter. You don't even have time to ask what, as an absurdly fast storm of space debris catches you off guard. It shakes everything around you. You try to hold on tight to the strap that's keeping you safe, but oh no! A piece of debris just hit your helmet shield. Come in, Bob, are you okay? Sarah asks you through the radio. You got a bit shocked by the impact, but everything seems fine. The meteorites are finally gone, so you can focus on your task now. You pull the rope that's connecting the new docking shield closer to your body, but the other part of the rope has nothing on it. Zip. Nada. Oh my. You think to yourself. Hmm, come in, Sarah. We have a lost shield. I repeat, we have a lost shield. This is a pretty serious situation, and you are aware of it. Anything that falls into space can go into a collision route with the International Space Station or with other space vehicles. You try to remember your training, but your mind goes blank. This is worse than that one time you broke your girlfriend's favorite ceramic jar. Sarah, the other astronaut who's with you on the ship, is shouting words on the transmitter. Oh no, Bob. Tell me you didn't do this. This is a total catastrophe. I'm coming outside. You spot the shield under the ISS. It's the size of a medium-sized car door, and it's moving quite fast. Here's what can happen in this scenario. The shield could head back down to Earth and break into the atmosphere. It would probably catch fire and disintegrate on the way down, but anyways, it would make NASA and you look pretty bad. The other option is the car door-sized shield gains momentum, and it orbits all the way to hit the ISS, and you for that matter, or some satellite that happens to be in a similar orbit. Here's the thing. If you ever thought that space was an infinite void, you got that part wrong. Since different countries started to build equipment strong enough to travel in space, space has been more crowded than ever. Not with people, but with satellites, asteroids, and space debris. You were surprised when you learned that Earth receives meteorite showers every single day, but they're so small that no one on the surface of the planet notices it. They usually turn to ashes before hitting the ground, but that's not all. What just happened to you on this mission has happened on several other missions before. Astronauts keep losing stuff in outer space. So much so that NASA had to create a division to track down and monitor the orbit of all debris that is just floating carelessly around. You couldn't believe it when someone told you that there are over 23,000 softball-sized pieces of debris roaming around in space. And if we're talking about smaller objects, then that number goes up to half a million. As you were about to unstrap yourself and dangerously venture through outer space without any protection, you notice Sarah has beat you to it. You can't let her do this alone. So you decide to tag along. FYI, this is against every NASA handbook and training you ever received in your life. But you think, if this works in sci-fi movies, it must work for us. Even though we all know that's very far from the truth. Sarah's close to the debris shield, but her body weight makes her orbit in a completely different direction. Okay, you think to yourself, this is your turn to shine and be a hero. You try moving your arms like you would do underwater, but there's no friction in space. Duh. You can't butterfly swim your way to rescue the rogue equipment. You try to contact Sarah, but she doesn't come in. I guess you're on your own now. For some reason, you start to orbit in a similar route as the floating car door shield. It must be the amount of stuff you've got strapped onto yourself. 
Or maybe it was the breakfast burrito you had that morning. You feel like you're George Clooney in the movie Gravity. No, better yet, you feel like Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yes, you're feeling as strong and powerful as a Jedi right now. You keep your hands stretched before your body, hoping you'll gently collide with the space debris. And three, two, one, and the landing was successful. Just joking, but yes, you managed to dock onto the debris. Hooray. Now what? You think? Guess you needed to have gone through that plan of yours a little bit more, huh? You still have no way of steering the debris. And now, you have no way to contact Mission Control and tell them the object, and yourself, are en route to somewhere. Don't get scared. You didn't come this far to get scared. What's the best thing you can do? First, take a mental picture of the Earth. It never disappoints from up here. Then, you try to play out the possible scenarios that could happen in the situationship you're in. Your normal body weight would not be enough to get you out of Earth's orbit. In the hypothetical scenario in which this did happen, you'd probably be vacuumed into Venus's orbit and spend a quite unpleasant period of your life around immense heat. Even though in Greek mythology, Venus represents love, there is nothing lovely about orbiting close to this planet, and you know this. If you got too close, your spacesuit would never be able to take on the heat. It's only made to sustain temperatures of around 250 degrees Fahrenheit tops, and Venus's atmosphere can heat up to 700 degrees Fahrenheit. But honestly, the worst case scenario is much simpler than that. Your spacesuit could decide to drown your ears, nose, and mouth in water. Yep. This has happened on spacewalks before yours. You see, in order to keep your spacesuit chill and cool, the suit relies on a gallon's worth of water that makes up for a cooling system. This system, which is supposed to send recycled air into the back of your helmet, does leak sometimes. And since you're stranded in the middle of the big nowhere, you'd have only that nowhere to run. But wait, what's that popping up on the horizon? It's a modular space shuttle. You try shouting, but nobody can hear you outside your helmet. You wave with your hands, uh, but it's coming straight at you. Finally, it took longer than I wished to find you, Sarah said. Apparently, she made it back to the space station just in time to catch you before you went definitely rogue. Guess I'll be losing some astronaut points for this little misadventure, huh? You say, and yes, you definitely will. On August 2, 1996, huge, mysterious patterns appeared on an agricultural field in Chiseldon, England. No one knew what kinds of symbols those were and who left them. As soon as the local news reported this, people immediately began to make their guesses. The most popular version was a message from a civilization living on another planet. The first crop circles appeared in the 70s in many areas across the U.S. and England. Some compared these symbols to the writings of the ancient Maya. Others thought those were messages about the approaching apocalypse. But few doubted that their authors were from another civilization. But that geometric pattern in Chiseldon was different from all the others because of an event that happened eight years later. In 2004, a man from New Mexico found a strange stone 11 miles from Roswell. The rock had the same pattern on it as the crop circle in Chiseldon. It's worth noting that Roswell became a famous place after, according to rumors and legends, a spaceship from another planet crashed there. Therefore, when the farmer found the stone and posted its photo on the internet, many people thought it was part of that spaceship. The stone was perfectly smooth, and the pattern was applied with incredible precision. But the most remarkable thing was its magnetic properties. It rotated counterclockwise when people put the magnet next to its northern part. When they left the magnet near the southern side, the stone turned in the other direction. Computed tomography and x-rays showed that there hadn't been any elements inside the stone that could cause rotation. It was just a smooth piece of rock. But was the Roswell rock really part of a spaceship? To answer this question, we need to move to England, the year 1976. An artist named Doug Bauer met his friend Dave Corley and invited him to create an impressive performance. At that time, people only learned about strange patterns in the fields from some books and records. And of course, none of these cases had been confirmed. The two friends understood that all this was nothing more than myths. 
Therefore, they decided to draw a big pattern in a wheat field in Wiltshire. Now, they didn't expect this drawing to become so popular. Many newspapers began to write about mysterious circles. Hundreds of reporters filmed it on their cameras, and people watching TV were shocked. From that moment on, crop circles became a cultural phenomenon. People mixed facts with fiction and created more and more unbelievable legends. Someone said that they had seen mysterious lights in the sky above the circles. In any case, those two friends continued to draw patterns and revealed their secret only in 2009. They also created the mysterious drawing in Chiseldon, but that Roswell rock wasn't their job. Anyway, they said that the stone was also a fake. Other artists could draw the same pattern on the rock using stone-cutting equipment. One of the most mysterious books in the world is the Voynich Manuscript. Nobody knows who its author was, but they wrote it in the 15th century. No one can understand the contents of this manuscript, consisting of 240 pages, for more than 500 years. Now, just imagine all the words were written in hand in an unknown language. Almost every page is decorated with strange images of female figures and weird unknown plants. The book was first discovered in 1912 and immediately became a cultural phenomenon. Many scientists, polyglots, and historians have tried to decipher the language and understand its meaning. They put it on the internet so everyone could try to solve the mystery. And it seems that Nicholas Gibbs, a historian and writer, managed to do this. He spent many years studying medieval Latin language and literature. Gibbs noticed the manuscript contained Latin abbreviations often used in medieval medical papers and reference books. Gibbs even found out that the book was a plagiarism of other older medical reference works. He compared the Voynich manuscript with other Latin books and found many similar words. Gibbs claimed that the manuscript was dedicated to women's health, and the mysterious flowers were real herbs and plants. But it wasn't that simple. Nicholas Gibbs was one of many who put forward the theory. Many scientists recognized his version as banal and unconvincing. Other decoders claimed that some secret code was used in the manuscript. Some were sure it was written by Dominican nuns. Others described it as a reference book on astrology and herbs. Anyway, you can find scans of the manuscript in high resolution on the internet and try to crack the code yourself. Imagine that you're walking around New York and entering a dark, deserted alley. Then you see some canvas with a beautiful picture on it lying in a trash can. You don't really understand what exactly is depicted there, but you still feel some power of art emanating from it. You take the painting home and hang it on the wall. It's been hanging there almost four years. Then you publish a photo with the painting on the website with antiques and discover that this picture is a missing masterpiece worth $1 million. This is a real story that happened to a New Yorker in 2003. Famous Mexican artist Rufino Tamayo painted this picture called Three People in 1970. One collector bought it as a gift for his wife. But in 1989, someone stole the work while they were moving to a new house. It was possible that the thief didn't appreciate this piece of art or couldn't find a buyer, so they threw it into the nearest trash can. The woman who found it returned the work to the owner and received a $15,000 reward. Expensive paintings often end up in trash cans. Van Gogh gave his works to various people, but they didn't take them seriously at that time. When these paintings were found many years later, they were estimated at tens of millions of dollars. For example, the artist gave his doctor his portrait. The doctor was horrified by the painting. Perhaps he didn't like the red shade of the hair. He gave the portrait to his mother, and she found a use for it. She covered the hole in her chicken coop with the picture. For more than 10 years, chickens had been running under the work of art. Then another artist found the painting. He paid the doctor pennies for it. Now it's estimated at $50 million. A similar case with a discarded work of art occurred in Italy. A gardener who worked at the Ricci Adi Gallery of Modern Art was removing ivy from the building's walls and found a rusty metal door in the thicket. He opened it and got into a dark room. There was a garbage bag lying there. The gardener wanted to throw it in the trash but decided to look inside first. And he found the lost work of famous artist Gustav Klimt. 
During the renovation of the gallery in 1997, someone stole the painting, Portrait of a Lady. It turned out that the thief had never taken it out of the building. Its value is estimated at $66 million. In 1901, collectors of sea sponges discovered a mysterious chest in the sea near Greece. There was a strange object inside, similar to a mechanical watch and the size of a shoebox. The finding attracted the attention of archaeologists. They quickly established that this item was created in ancient Greece about 2,200 years ago. They called it the Antikythera mechanism. Now it's in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. Scientists have found out that this object is only 82 fragments, one-third of the original mechanism. It's still unknown who created it and how it works. But experts think it was a mechanical computer with bronze gears and other parts. People use it for astronomical calculations. The device could track the movements of the Sun, the Moon, and five planets of the solar system. Experts are still trying to figure out all the properties of this machine. It's considered to be the oldest computer on Earth. It proves that the level of technology 2,000 years ago was much higher than we could imagine. It's raining cats and dogs, literally. Things falling down from the sky can be pretty unexpected. So here are some examples. Residents of Texarkana, Texas once had light rain and fish shower. No need to go fishing out in the sea. The fish literally falls down on your head. In fact, animal rains are not uncommon. Water spouts or updrafts occurring in different corners of the earth sometimes carry small creatures up with them. Those could be crabs, frogs, or indeed, fish. A water spout is generally a whirlwind that picks up water and grows in size until it connects the surface of the water and the clouds. Lightweight critters living close to the water surface often get caught in the vortex and carried up and away. Thunderstorm clouds are constant companions of water spouts too. When the storm reaches a landmass, it starts slowing down, having nowhere to take the new energy from. It slowly subsides, the atmospheric pressure drops, and the thunderclouds release the water in them, along with the unfortunate small animals and fish. Sometimes it's just a few frogs frozen from the cold up above, but at other times it could be hundreds or thousands of creatures raining down upon the land. A much more unusual rain once happened in Oakville, Washington, and it's still waiting for someone to explain it. The rain clouds looked perfectly normal, but the rain they released was anything but. Translucent jelly-like blobs fell on the town, covering a total area of about 20 square miles. Each of them wasn't larger than a grain of rice. Researchers who studied these raindrops claimed that the gooey blobs contained human white blood cells. Some believe they might have been evaporated jellyfish resulting in rain, or waste from a commercial airplane. Now this kind of rain is what I'd like to see someday, a money shower. One such event occurred in a small town in Germany. A woman was driving when she suddenly saw banknotes swirling down from the sky, so she hit the brakes. She went out of her car and later said she managed to collect quite a large amount of money. After which, as any responsible citizen should, she turned it over to the police. Strangely, when the officers came back to the scene with the woman, they couldn't find any more cash, although she claimed she hadn't been able to collect everything. There's still no explanation for the event, but certainly, no water spout could have caused that. A pretty unpleasant kind of rain happened back in 1876 in Olympia Springs, Kentucky. It was a very local kind, too. Mrs. Crouch said that she had been making soap outside her home when pieces of raw meat suddenly started falling down from the sky around her. Some of those chunks were pretty massive, reaching over three inches in diameter. Local newspapers reported that two people who decided to remain unknown tasted the meat and concluded it was mutton or venison. Months later, scientists decided to find out the truth behind the strange event. It became a matter of heated debate until one of the researchers came up with the most reasonable conclusion. The meat rain must have been caused by vultures flying over the town at the time. These birds sometimes regurgitate food right in the middle of their flight as a defense mechanism, or to make their bodies lighter to fly faster. And that must have been what happened right over Mrs. Crouch's house, unfortunately. 
something totally inedible, but no less sinister, rained down on several villages in India in the middle of May of 2022. Huge black and silver metal balls started dropping from the sky, the first one weighing over 15 pounds. Astounded residents watched in shock as it hammered the ground, scattering pieces of itself across the nearby fields. Similar balls later fell in the other two neighboring villages. Luckily, no one was harmed during the strange metal rain, but the issue remained. We're on Earth, and it usually rains water here. The local authorities weren't sure what it was about, but astronomers soon voiced a theory that it could be debris from a space rocket. One that fits the description had launched in September of 2021, aiming to put a communications satellite into orbit. Upon its re-entry into the atmosphere, it might have been damaged, causing several chunks of it to detach and fall down on the ground in India. Sometimes it rains birds, too. One such event occurred in Arkansas in 2010. Weather conditions might cause things like that to happen, but there are simpler reasons, too. Loud noise and confusion, or even collisions with aircraft. In the case of Arkansas, it was the noise and flashing lights from the New Year's Eve fireworks. The show startled thousands of birds and made them start into the air. They were panicking and disoriented, so they collided with buildings, cars, and trees. Many of them eventually fell to the ground, making lots of people believe it was actually raining birds. Now, if anything could startle me out in the sky, it's a rain of spiders. And if you wonder whether it's a real thing, well, yes, it is. In Australia, spider rains actually happen quite often. They even have a name for this, ballooning. It goes like this. Spiders that can balloon climb up trees and tall bushes, trying to reach the highest point available in the area. When they've climbed up to the very top, they spin their web in such a way that it allows them to be carried by the wind. And there it goes, clutching the strands of the web with its tiny little feet. The brave spider lifts off into the air and flies to whatever awaits it out there. Normally, ballooning goes unnoticed by us humans because spiders don't travel in large groups. You might have a shocking experience when a spider suddenly lands on your face out of nowhere, but otherwise, it's a rare occasion to meet more than two ballooners at once. Still, when the weather gets particularly bad, with lots of rain or wind, thousands or even millions of spiders might decide it's time to move to somewhere friendlier and take to the sky all at once. That's when spider rains occur. Those who witnessed the most recent ones back in 2012 and 2015 say it looks like a snowfall. Spiders slowly drifting down on their web parachutes that settle on the ground and turn it white. Remember water spouts? Well, those things can lift not only fish and frogs into the sky and make a spectacular show of them falling back on the ground. Golf balls sometimes become their cargo too. And I'm not speaking of golf ball sized hail, but actual balls. The town of Punta Gorda in Florida witnessed a rain of golf balls in 1969. Newspapers reported dozens upon dozens of those things pummeling the ground and buildings for a short while. Since it's a coastal town with lots of golf courses, it wasn't hard to explain the event. A water spout must have formed near the shore, traveled to some course, grabbed a few dozen golf balls, and then released them over the town. Rain can be pretty refreshing, as long as it's not mud rain. On April 12, 1902, the town of Easton, Philadelphia experienced an unusual shower. It made all those unfortunate enough to go outside take an actual shower and wash their clothes to boot. The raindrops looked dirty to the eye, and they were. People, buildings, and streets looked really wanting to take a good bath after it stopped pouring. The witnesses reported a considerable amount of dust in the air before the rain started, which probably explains the event. In 2011, a town in Scotland saw another weird rain variety. It was showered with worms. The rain didn't cover a large area. It seems only some local academy students were unlucky enough to get invertebrates falling on their heads while playing soccer. There was a significant change in the weather at the time, so scientists believe it might have resulted from some meteorological anomaly.